that back there at that door and just come into God's house where we can have some time with just Him, you know, corporately together with just Him and just lay our heads on His chest and say, God, you know, just hold me a while, you know, and that stuff will be waiting on you when you get out there, but you're going to go out there hopefully knowing that God wants out these doors with you and you're not alone and world is spinning out of control, but God is holding you in the world as soon as he wants. Father, we thank you so much, God, for your mercy and your grace and your son, Jesus. God, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to be here to gather together in your name and corporately lift up your name and tell you how holy and mighty and wonderful and great you are, God. We ask that you would cleanse our hearts, our minds, our gifts, God, that there would be nothing that would stand between you and us, Lord, God. We lay it all down, God. We can spend this time together, and when we leave here, God, we're going to be that closer child to the Father than we were when we came in. God, we ask that you anoint and bless our pastor's heart and his mouth, God, that he can bring forth the word with the fervency in the fire, God, and bless our hearts, God, and open up that we can receive what you have for us, Lord. God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, Lord God, that that peace that comes from you, God, that they would find that peace before they leave this place, leave this place today, Lord. We thank you for all great things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
joy this morning i'm thankful the lord gives us a joy that is so much more than happiness it's a joy that the world cannot take away man it's so good to have steve back up here with us this morning isn't it hey man we have missed him he's had some some vocal issues and we are thankful the lord has has brought him back to to be with us what a blessing he is he's going to sing another song for us here and the song talks about how that god is just always there for us he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Sister Mary Ann's going to be having some surgery in the morning. Uh, we want you to pray for her as she goes. Uh, God's going to be right there with you. Uh, Sister Bobby is going to have some surgery uh, at some point this week. Uh, Bobby Van Hus. So please keep Bobby in your prayers. But this song is just a reminder that you know, he's always been there for us. Amen. And he always will be. Hallelujah. You told me that life may not be easy, and everything I need, you've already given me. I remember how you told me I could trust you completely. So, why am I? Changed by your mercy, I'm covered by your peace. I'm living out the victory, but that don't mean I won't feel the heat.
our redemption. Lord, how could I question when you prove that you die for me? You want me through fire. All throughout my history, faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms make way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I my 
So why should I fear the sing this old chorus with us. so true there is no one like you you are the king of kings and you are the lord of lords you have all power in heaven and in earth all things are in your hands even when it don't look like it it don't feel like it we know it's true your word declares it to be and you are god beside you there's none other and right now father we just worship you give you our praise and our adoration because you and you alone are worthy and you are god and we declare that you are Lord of our lives this day. In Jesus' name, we all pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Pastor is going to come. Um, welcome and... Uh, you need a theology of providence, okay? I just have to say that. Uh, you and I both, we all need a theology of providence. And you're saying, what in the world is he talking about? For these songs to really have, to resonate in you, in your life, in your experience, You need a depth of understanding of who God is.
and the old preachers and I'm talking about real old like 17th 16th 17th century used a term that we don't hear used very often today but it is the term providence and the idea of providence meant that there was an understanding of the nature of God that in the world and in life there would there would be all kinds of things to deal with many good things many bad things but in the midst of the fluctuations of life the people's minds were grounded in an understanding of the nature of God and more than that the nature of God being in providential control and care of our lives that's why I say we need a theology of providence that that regardless of what circumstances of life bring our mind and our heart is anchored in something greater in something eternal and it is in the providence of God and the providence of God lets you walk or helps you walk in with through you with the fire and against the winds of adversity so that's not the sermon that's the prelude our children may be, may be dismissed to the children's uh, or children's service and I want to in I want to invite you to mark chapter 11 and as they're leaving um, I want to kind of do a little promo real quick on we're starting a new study on Wednesday nights called the Christ life uh, it's a book that uh, it's been out a few years now it's discovering your destiny in Christ through understanding the Bible. Where you get the theology of providence is in the Bible. That's where our founders got it. That's where I mean, it's that's that's where it's at. It's in the Scripture. But uh, this this little book is is going to help, and we're going to study along with you're going to study along with me, and we're going to study through it. This helps you understand life and its meaning. What is the meaning of life? It's going to help you understand the Bible and with with the principles of biblical interpretation how to understand it how to understand the flow and the progressive nature of scripture how it flows and uh, it, it also is going to help you in spiritual ideas of spiritual formation meaning it'll help you with some of the practical things you deal with in life like who you are in christ so that's wednesday nights and uh, we will begin that at six thirty. uh remember awana will be uh, it's not yet yeah, one of this is this week and uh, that's at 545 there's a meal you can be a part of that and then 630 will be Bible study and this is a perfect for any age group by the way um, but I particularly encourage young people to come to this as well um, so remember that also Saturday is Star Queen with Tommy Oaks and John Thomas they'll be with us this Saturday at five o'clock and you don't want to miss that that is going to be a fun evening and uh, it's interactive for the whole kids. You won't be expected to do anything, by the way. Like you don't have to get up in front of people. If that scares you. Don't don't you won't. But it's interactive. And many of you have seen Star Queen know what I'm talking about. And Tommy will be with us next week as well. So let's look in Mark chapter 11. And um, we're going to look at Jesus and traveling with Jesus. And this has just been for me it's this series has has allowed me to kind of walk the steps of jesus in the bible so we're going to look at mark chapter 11 you're going to know these and you're going to say greg you're you're a little early on this this is the triumphal entry it is well we're gonna we're gonna get this just a little bit early but it's okay um but we're on the road with jesus and we're straightway with Jesus. We're walking with Jesus. And I, I dare say that there's not one person here that you're saying in your own life, is that, you know, I, yeah, I'd like to walk closer to Christ. I, I know I want to walk near him. And his disciples had the same desire. They wanted to walk close to Jesus. And the idea was is that Jesus was the rabbi 
and they were his disciples, meaning they were like his students. They were under his tutelage, and they were with him 24-7. So, you know, they, they were with him all the time. And the idea was is that you would follow so close to the teaching of your rabbi or in the proximity of the rabbi that the dust of, of, from the rabbi's sandals would kind of spill over on you. And that's what it meant to walk close. And I dare say that, that, that most of you here this morning, if you've trusted Christ, you're wanting, you're, you're saying in your heart, I, you know, I want a closer walk with Jesus. I want to walk closer to him. I want to walk closer to Christ. How about you? Well, we're, we're finding out is that people followed Jesus for different reasons. So you had his disciples who had left everything to follow Jesus, and they were following him, and they were following him with, I mean, they had seen so many great things happen. They had heard monumental teaching that is passed down in history. They'd seen him do miracles. They had seen other people there that have, have, are just kind of curious. Wonder who, who is this about? They had other people yet had aspirations to see Jesus to be some sort of political leader, maybe. Others just didn't like him, period. They saw Jesus to be a threat to the religious system. And so there, there is this multiple, when, when you ask somebody, if you were to sit down to interview somebody in first century and you could say, what do you think about Jesus of Nazareth? You'd have got all kinds of different answers. Some people say, well, he's, he, well, he's, God, he's God the Son. He's the Messiah. You'd have others to say, well, he claims to be that. There were others that would claim that, that he was from the devil. Because of his claims. So there was all kinds of different motivations of why people followed Jesus. Which is a good question. Why do you follow? Why, why is it that you follow Jesus? Or at least try to. Some people in following Jesus were totally disappointed. Totally. You say, well, God, did. they were totally disappointed because he didn't meet their expectations. And you say it's possible. Well, yeah, it's possible. There were others that followed Jesus and their lives were changed dramatically. And so there's this great crowd that around that around that surround Jesus and everyone has a different experience and everyone has a different way of even looking at Jesus. So they're on their way to Jerusalem. This is the last this will culminate in what has been given in the gospels. Most of, the, of what is written history is about this last week in Jesus' life. And we're going to see it as a triumphal entry. Jesus was on the road to Jerusalem. He was on the road with his disciples to Jerusalem. He had healed and raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. There, there was great interest in Jesus. Great interest in him. In so many different directions as it related to him as a person. Now let's look at the scripture. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent... He sent two of his disciples. That sounds like Jesus. He sent them out by twos. Well, he sends two of them out. And he said, go into the village opposite you. And as 
as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. Look at verse 4. So they went their way, they found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, uh, what, are, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. And so they let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the uh, on the coat and then those who went before him and they cried out saying hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord blessed is the kingdom of our father david that comes in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest and jesus went into jerusalem and into the temple and so when he looked around at all things as the hour was already late he went out to bethany with the twelve. That is the word of the Lord. I want you to look at a, a map with me. This is this is the journey. And if we were traveling with Jesus, this this kind of this map here kind of gives you the contours where they were heading. I wanted you to see this because I I like mountains and they were they were climbing some mountains. They had they had come from basically uh, they they were coming down to, to Bethany they were climbing up to the hill country, and they would go to a little town called Bethpage. A little town, town called Bethpage, the house of unripened figs. Bethany itself was known as a house of sorrows. And as you see that, that, that at Bethpage, it was known as the entrance into the holy city. It was kind of like, uh, it was kind of like, you know, we go, you go to, some of you say, well, we're going to Gatlinburg this weekend. And what you really mean is you're going to Pigeon Forge. You may not see Gatlinburg. Why? You may, it's kind of like that's, that town before you get into Gatlinburg. And I think the same is true here. Bethpage was, that, was the entrance kind of into the city, uh, the holy city, city of Jerusalem. Notice the Garden of Gethsemane. All of these, all of these places will be the places that you will see Jesus attending the last week of his life. And Jesus was heading to the temple. Now, is, is this significant? It certainly is significant. Because the expectation of, of a Messiah would actually take this route. He would, be coming, he would be coming from east and going into the west part of the city, and then he would enter the eastern gate. There was 12 gates to the holy city. And Jesus was, was heading in the direction that they understood in their culture and in their day the, the way that the Messiah would come in. Jesus was fitting the bill. He was fitting the bill of the Messiah in so many ways. He was from the lineage of David. So he was, he was in royal in, in the royal lineage of ancestry. And he was entering the holy city as Messiah. As Messiah. So I want, I want you to, to think about this and look at this, at this. And there's three things that I want you to take away this morning from this message. The first one is this. Is that Jesus comes in fulfillment of the prophet's promise. In other words, there was this growing expectation among the people that Jesus, or that the Messiah, would indeed come. That the Messiah would come. It was their aspiration. It was their hopes. And so we have numerous Old Testament prophets who prophesied of the coming Messiah, namely Isaiah, Zechariah, and even as far back in the Genesis, the Proto-Evangelion, the Genesis 3.15, 
where the promise of the Messiah that would crush the head of the serpent. So the, the idea of Messiah to come was in their way of thinking. And it was, it was in line with the prophet's promises. Also, we see another thing here. This is a foreshadow of Jesus in his millennial kingdom. This is a foreshadow that Jesus will indeed come and reign. The first time he came, he came as a suffering servant. Uh, a, suf a suffering servant. But he will come as a reigning king. And then we find that he is a faithful king, obedient to the Father's will. Somehow Isaiah 53 and some of the other passages that related to the reality of Jesus or the Messiah being a suffering servant had lost their way of mind and thinking. Matter of fact, in many people's mind and thinking who were following Jesus, they were thinking maybe that somebody would come and set some things straight because there was a lot of things that were wrong. And that this Messiah would come and he would assume the throne. And there would, there would be again the golden era for the people on the throne of David. And there were many that claimed to be Messiahs. They claimed to have that right. And it never was fulfilled obviously in and through them. So, let's look. First of all, Jesus comes in fulfillment of the prophet's promise. Notice he sent, he sent out two of his disciples. They went to the village, and this village was Bethphage. And so they entered it. They found the colt that was tied. They brought it, they brought it back, loosed it, and that Jesus begins to make a trip um, to Jerusalem on this colt. Now notice here, Jesus is not asking his disciples to go steal a colt, okay? He's not saying, hey, go get me. He's not asking that. But what he is saying is that, is that, is that it, it will be, we see divine foreknowledge. Uh, by the way, uh, that's a good aspect of God's providence, God's foreknowledge. God knows. He knows, and Jesus knew. Jesus knew that there would be a coat there, and, and he instructed his disciples, and lo and behold, it was there. And uh, he asked them, and they sent it, and immediately they came their way into Jerusalem. They would come their way into Jerusalem. So he comes in fulfillment of the prophecy. Look at, look at the next verse, verse 4 goes on to say so they went their way and they found the colt tied by the door and outside on the street and they loosed it but some of those who stood there and said to them why are you doing loosing the coat and they spoke Jesus has commanded so so they let them go so they brought the coat to Jesus and notice what they did they placed their clothes on it and he sat on it that's a real simple picture isn't it Jesus is entering the city on a beast that is that, that we would call a beast of burden. It would it would be a labor. It would be used for labor. He's entering the city in a very humble fashion. Not like a not like an emperor that that would would enter you know enter uh, an emperor would enter on a stallion with this great entourage big white stallion that would say there's power there's significance there's 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 greatness now Jesus comes in now th this this has some old testament precedents by the way, 
the anointing and the coronation of Solomon. And David rode a mule in the city. The anointing of Jehu, the king of Israel, the spreading of the garments. They spread their garments out for Jehu. It was like the rolling out the red carpet kind of thing. Um, the entrance of David's Messiah, we find it. Matter of fact, Zechariah chapter 9 talks about this. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of, of Zion. Shout, O daughter of, of, of Zion. Behold your king. Notice this. Behold your king is coming to you. He is just. He, he does what is right. And he has rescue. He has salvation. He is lowly and riding on the donkey, the colt of a fowl of a donkey. And he said, rejoice greatly. Well, the people understood that. They, they under, understood that. And they did rejoice greatly. So Jesus came in humility. Now I want you. I want you. I want us to just kind of step back for just a second, because if you would have been the average Roman citizen in that day, in time, you would be thinking that he here is a rabbi, a teacher, no assemblage of power, nothing that would be drawn in the sense that would say that he's a great political leader to come in to make any kind of great change. There, there was none of that. There were no statues of Jesus in, like there were the emperors in the city. Nothing like that. No. No, this is, this is, a, this is, a, lowly, this is a lowly teacher who's coming in the city, and he's making his entrance as Messiah. He's making his entrance. Their day had arrived. Now, there were some there that probably understood it to the degree in which they could understand it. There were others that were like, hey, he's what we've been waiting on. He's the one. So, if you could imagine going to Jerusalem back in this first century, there would have been around 2 million to 2.5 million people coming from all around in one week's time to enter the holy city. And on the day that Jesus would enter would be the day that they would be looking for their lamb. And their lamb would be the choice lamb that would be laid as at the altar of sacrifice. No wonder John, the beloved, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said that. John the beloved wrote it down in his gospel. Behold, he has come. The Lamb of God. Now, think of the contrast of the entrance of God's kingdom and how the kingdoms of this world think. Jesus comes with great, great humility. And they worship him. And notice something here. Jesus does not forbid them to worship. So what are they doing? They lay, they lay the, their garments on the colt. They're laying garments out, and they're waving palm branches. And Jesus is riding in this in this little trip from Bethphage across the hillsides, past the Mount of Olives to the Holy City, and there were a crowd of people there. Crowd. Matter of fact, 
this act of this act and, and scenario would have alerted the Roman authorities. They were looking for revolts. And they would have been alerted. The Roman guards would have been alerted. Matter of fact, some of these things could have gotten Jesus arrested. Because they didn't want any kind of uprisings. Their deal was to maintain the Roman peace. And so it was as Jesus is entering the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, they're worshiping him. Oh no, there's all kinds of different people there. You say, well, some were sincere. Some of them were very, very sincere. I'm thinking about the blind man that Jesus healed. He was there. You think that he had a palm branch waving it around? Man, if I'd have been a blind man and I would have had, had Jesus had done that, I would have been there waving a palm branch and I would have been saying, Hosanna! How about you? I mean, it's something to shout about. Jesus has done this marvelous work in my life and he's Messiah, but uh, you remember the prophecies. He's also the suffering servant. I don't want, and think about the disciples, they didn't want that picture of Jesus. No, we like the kingdom stuff where we're with the power and we're sitting in the right and the left and, and, and you know, we want those places. We, that's, the, that's the image that we prefer. I can, I can grasp that, but what if the road is marked with suffering? And what if there's pain in the offering? What if following Jesus is a road that is not easy? It's easy to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes. I mean, I would have been there worshiping. I Many were. And I listen, there were many sincere, I believe, worshiping Jesus. There were others who had different aspirations. And you had the Pharisees who were there. And they were saying, what in the world is he doing? He is receiving worship. Only God is worthy of worship. And what did Jesus say? He says, if they don't, if they don't worship me, the rocks will cry out in their place. And I'll tell you what. We don't need rocks crying out when we've got a voice and, a, and lungs. To praise Christ. Amen? The power and reality of Jesus had come to town, their Messiah. But his road would be marked with suffering. Oh, it would just be a, a few days, and he'd be walking the trail of the Via Dolorosa, and he'd be making the way to Calvary. It wouldn't be too much longer that he'd be going to the to the Mount of Olives, or he would be going to the Garden of Gethsemane over there in that olive grove where the olive press was, and it was squeezing the oil out of the olives that the Son of God, his very life would be so pressured that his sweat would become as great drops of blood. Oh, his road would be marked with suffering and sorrow prophet said that he was acquainted with grief he was a man of sorrows and and there was anguish and sorrows but the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him in the garden upon the cross power of jesus this jesus that they were they were singing out hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord would be the same jesus who would who would walk up to the hill of the Mount of Olives, as you saw on the map, and he would look over the city. What is an odd, odd thing, I find, is that after all, the, all of this was, after all this time of worship and praise, and you would think that Jesus had, re had reached the pinnacle of his ministry and his career. He goes to the Mount of Olives, and you know what he does? He looks over the city, and he weeps. Because he knew that before the, ever a sacrifice would be made, that he would be rejected and despised of men. And yet all of this under 
the will of God. He cries. He weeps. You see, there would have been so many, including many of his disciples, in a broader sense, the disciples in a broader sense, they would have been very happy to say, you know, we want the kingdom stuff now. We want that picture. Little did they know what the week would hold. But now there's rejoicing. Jesus comes as a foreshadow of his millennial reign. You know, some of you may be saying, well, what's the takeaway from this? you got a king that's coming. You hear me? You have a king who's coming again. Make straight his paths in your heart. Your families. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Do you? I do. You say, yeah, preachers have talked about I know, they have. For years. Way before me. Do you know he's going to come back one day? And there's going to be a generation that's going to be surprised. Unexpected. But Jesus is going to, you know, people are wondering, you know, when's all the, you know, when's all the wrong things in the world going to be made right? Well, one day when kingdom come, comes. When the king of the kingdom comes. All the wrongs will be made right. Everything. And it will be with righteous judgment. Notice here. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David, who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Yeah. We're ready. Foreshadow. It's only a foreshadow. The reality of Jesus' second coming. The first, the, listen, Jesus riding into Jerusalem was by the will of God. It was not a mistake. The cross was not a mistake. No, it was by the will of God. He would suffer for man's sin. He would get down to the very heart of the issue of the fallenness of humanity. And then he would go to the cross and he would conquer death. There would be an empty tomb, and there would be life, and there would be the reality that Christ's life can live in you and me. So blessed is he who believes and, and yet is not seen, but there is a blessing, a blessedness for those who have believed the testimony of the gospel of Christ to bring salvation. Do you believe it? See, just as I believed at the age of 15 that there was that Jesus was coming again, at the age of 60, I'm more convinced that he's coming and that his coming is closer. We look at the things in the world around us and we shudder. And we should. Fearful things. But it's not, it's not devolving into chaos. No, it's, it's, it, is, it is going to consummation. And that's the words of Rob Morgan, and I like it. It is going to consummation. In other words, the pinnacle of all of human history is going somewhere, and it is coming in the revelation of Christ. And he's coming again. And if you don't have that sense of urgency and the reality of it, you see, that sense of urgency causes you to want to live pure and holy before the Lord. It causes you to want to share the gospel with your family. It causes you to want to say the reality of Jesus, just as his first, his first riding was in, on a donkey in the, in, in, into Jerusalem, 
He would be going as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He is coming again to judge the living and the dead. As a sense of urgency captured our hearts today, I'm looking for Jesus. Anytime. We're promised that in, in, in the reality of the rapture of the church. And we're promised that also in the second coming. But regardless, we're going to see him. Face to face. And I just wonder, are you, are you, do you know him? Are you ready for him? Do you, do you know him? Or, uh, I, I didn't expect that part of Jesus. What if that's a part of his kingdom plan? Are you ready for it? How about your family? The power and reality, the power and reality of the cross and the gospel. We have an opportunity to share the gospel, which is good news. That people's hearts and minds and their lives can be ready for the day that, and hour that they see him. coming again that's why you know you want to to look for him keep your eye and your focus that's why all of last year by the way if you remember our key verse was hebrews our focus was on christ we're looking for him. the author and finisher of our faith without that all that you have is an ethical jesus who gives you some moral platitudes to live by. And they're good. But what if there's more? The reality, the reality of the coming king, the reality of the king of kings will come as Savior and Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone. Face to face. Creator, the maker and reality of his reign. And his reign it will be a righteous reign. Here's the last thing that we see from heaven's king. And the standpoint is this. He came in the will of the Father. So notice here. Where did Jesus go? They went exactly straight to the temple. The hour is late. He goes into the temple for an hour. And he leaves. They go back to Bethany. Make an all the way trip back to Bethany. Probably to Martha and Mary's home probably where they were staying with, with the twelve but he comes in, will, in the will of the father so what do we see about heaven's king here's what we see we see that he was humble he was a servant we see that he was a great high priest he was a high priest he was a priestly king in other words, he was the one that you go to to know God. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. He was worthy. He was worthy of every, of every word that was, that was spoken in, in accolation of his name that day and every day forever because angels do it constantly. Worthy. But he's also suffering. What is a real stark contrast is that the beautiful day that Palm Sunday, this, this day that he rode in to Jerusalem was, would be in just a few hours there would be cries from the cross, the crucifixion. That's real sobering. That's very sobering that things could turn so bad from a human standpoint. But it was all in the will of God. Heaven's king 
Think about this. Bows down and he serves. He washes his feet. He presents himself as a lamb. The lamb of God. He presents himself in the greatest humility with really no, very little expectation other than if you follow me, obey. Live in obedience. Evans King came for you. Came for me. Evans King came to suffer. The, the, the cross was the plan of God. If you ever wonder, God knows what's going on in your life with the suffering that you're dealing with, I guarantee you, you've never experienced anything like this week in Jesus' life. I've never. Would ever want to. It was horrendous suffering, emotional pain, desperation to cry out on a cross, ask God why in all of his humanity, and he was fully human, as well as being fully God. He would cry out on the cross as the life was ebbing out of his body and as the blood was flowing freely, that would be the last lamb. The one and final sacrifice that would be the sacrifice of all. And it would be God coming to you and doing it. And then God coming to the gates of hell and failing you. Bursting it open. Sunday morning, the next week would be a whole new, a whole, a whole new day. There would be a whole new creation. There would be a, uh, listen, he's in Christ, he's a new creature. There's a new, there's something new that's going on on the inside of, of the dead part of us that was in sin and trespasses. Why? Because our king came for us. Our king said, I love you. And I come to where you are, that you can know me. And that's why there's no king like King Jesus. Listen, he just doesn't come to make our life a little bit better. He comes to take over and change our lives and bring a new day of hope and healing and forgiveness and freedom from guilt and shame and the power of death that, that stalks each and every one of us. The power and reality of Jesus says that I've conquered it all. And I'm the king that has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And behold, I am coming again. The power and reality of Jesus. Oh, I'm looking for him and longing for him. I long for my king. How about you? All to see him. face to face no wonder John said these words even so come quickly Lord come quickly come quickly let's bow for prayer Praise band, if y'all want to come back. Do you know him? Oh, I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Quite frankly, we've never been loved with such a purity and such a grace and that which is shown by Christ. And you know the great thing about it? 
He, he doesn't ask us to just become religious. He simply says, I want to be the king first of all of your heart. I want to be your savior and I want to be your Lord. And he does. And he pursues us with so much patience. I, I wonder if, if you've ever have you ever opened that part of your heart up to say, Lord, I know there's some things not right in there. But I'm asking you and opening this door that you come in and forgive me and clean my heart you see there could there could be a new day for you new life new outlook and it could be real what do you want from me well bar and all these other things that you say well I need this and I need that and I need this thing over here in my life and I need that thing over there H have you come to the conclusion that what you need most is a savior and a lord because that's where you begin with Jesus and I honestly think that's where many people become disappointed with God Jesus comes as Savior and Lord and we follow. It's that simple. What, what could happen today if you just simply said yes to him? Say yes, Lord. Now we're not going to make a big dramatic thing about, out about this, but you know this could be in right where you're sitting. You could say, you know, I really, I need the Savior. I need Him. Well, He comes for you. He does. He comes for you, and He 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 lets you know in a service like this that you're not really forgotten. And, and honestly, quite frankly, he, it makes our heart uncomfortable because we know the need. Everything within us, we run from it because we've got better ways and better plans. Or we think we do at least. But what, what could happen if you opened the heart and said, you know, the struggle's over. I'm going to let Jesus be God. It could happen now. It could happen today. It could happen this moment. Is there one here? Say, Greg, I really need Christ. And I want to ask him into my heart today. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up and say, yes, I want to ask Jesus into my heart today. Anybody here at all? Take a minute and think about it. I was the age of 15 when I came to Christ. If I'd been obedient, I'd have come at the age of 14. Do you know him? You need to. You need to know him. You need him every hour. You need him every day. For some of us here this morning, we just needed a reminder that Jesus is coming. And it may be sooner than we think. 
we really we really need to be about kingdom work and business in our hearts. Why? Because it's real. Eternity is real. Heaven's real. Hell's real. And we need to know Christ. And everything within my heart as a pastor is I want you, if anything, as your shepherd, I want you to know that. And I want you to know that you know that. Father, I just pray and know that your word doesn't return void. Do you have a way of working in our hearts? draw us to yourself and um, I pray for the one here intently listening considering the words of Christ I pray you would continue to do your work in our lives and in our hearts with the power of your grace to call us to yourself. We love you. Help us for all of us who have made commitments to you. Help us to follow a little more closely and fix our gaze a little more upward. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord. Together we say amen. Please stand. I need thee every hour, most precious Lord.
you have a need, turn it over to Jesus. He invites us to cast our cares on Him because He cares for us. Amen. Any other announcements? Anything we need to mention? Don't forget Saturday at, is it 5? Five, 5 o'clock Saturday, uh, John Thomas and, and uh, Tommy Oaks here to put on their, uh, their little play, uh, Star Queen. It is absolutely fantastic. We don't want you to miss that. So please come. Invite folks to come and be a part of that. And, of course, Wednesday, our Awana meal at 545, uh, and then Awana and, and a Bible study will be taking place as well. Others? The men meeting Tuesday? No. Nope. Not, not this Tuesday. Women's, or, uh, women's, women's meeting tomorrow night. Got it. Okay. Yes. Oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right. God bless each of you. Let's go out there this week and make a difference. God wants to use us in somebody's life.